for a faculty presentation. <laughs> Much appreciated, I have to say. Um, it's really a, really a tall task, I think, to introduce someone who's accomplished as our guest today. Um, for one, she's read around the world, and today we're lucky enough to have us with lucky enough, lucky enough to have her with us here. In one of her three visits to London, she's been at Western, she's here, and later today she'll be at the Landon Library uh, in, in South London. So, Lorna Crozier, our guest, uh, is originally from Swift Current, Saskatchewan. We might ask her uh, at the end, how is it that Saskatchewan seems to be such a hotbed of writing activity to consistently produce such wonderful talent? Uh, that's an interesting question to think about. Um, Lorna, Lorna Crozier teaches writing in the writing program at the University of Victoria, Victoria, BC. She's written some 15 books of poetry, won the Governor General's Award, and many other prizes. She's written a memoir, which is here, uh, called Rare, Radical, and Beautiful, by one of my other favorite writers, Russell Lowe. Lorna Crozier has uh, edited an anthology of Canadian women writers called Desire, also here uh, for you to look at. And, and with her partner and fellow writer Patrick Lane, co-edited several books of poems and uh, an anthology of uh, very powerful essays about addiction called uh, Addictions. So, uh, Lauren Crozier is, is a writer who takes on a range of stances and uh, topics. Really a, a surprising writer. Her work shows she's a, a storyteller. Uh, she's notably a lover of animals. Uh, she writes about comfort of horses and how the souls of animals uh, revivify us. Uh, she's also the author of Unabashed Erotic Verse. Uh, often touched by the humorous. I, I, I don't know where else I would see carrot in permanent erection in the same verse. Uh, it's writing it's writing is wide open to the world. Lorna Crozier asks, if you open your eyes and the universe rolls in, there's room enough for sadness. But what of joy? And in other poems, the question is about beauty. So, we have stories, animals, sadness, joy, beauty, sex. I don't know what to, what we will be hearing about today or what might what else might be on that list, but uh, I'm eager for the details, and I would ask you to join me in welcoming Lauren. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, do you promise me that if you have your laptops open that you're actually making notes about the reading and not on whatever you're on? You know what I mean? I actually think laptops and poetry don't make nice companions. So um, keep them open only if you must and let me trust you on this one. One of the reasons I'm saying that is because one of my colleagues teaches at the uh, University of the Okanagan in uh, Penticton and she's the head of the writing department there and she happened to be auditing the course so she was sitting where you are and she noticed all the students who had their laptops open were not using them to take notes for the course, but were on their emails or whatever they were doing or Googling. So it's disconcerting. I'd rather you not be here and do that outside the room rather than in the room when I'm speaking. So that's my crabby professor uh, line. Now I'll put on my other hat, and that's a poet's hat. I'm very, very pleased to be in London. Um, I have read all over the world, but I never read in, in London before, so this is a real treat. And I know that uh, Professor Hutchinson had to arm wrestle the Poetry London organizer to get me here because she was afraid I'd be too tired and my last reading would be tonight. And so uh, we had to beg that I'd be allowed to be at, at Vanshaw College, and, and, and I'm delighted. Um, I know that some of you are, are interested in writing yourselves and that you're doing some writing. So I'm going to make sure that I leave room for questions or discussion towards the end. Can everybody hear me okay? I seem to disappear on the side of the room. Does my voice go over there? The You're all right? Mike's here. Oh, okay. It's because I'm hearing myself through this thing. Right. Okay, thank you. 
I thought I would read uh, some poems from uh, this book, which the bookstore has kind of brought in too. It's called The Blue Hour of the Day, and it's my selected poems. So supposedly the best poems I've written over the last uh, 20 years. So it goes back to 1985 up until 2007, I think. And I'll read a poem which um, says a little bit about how one writes poetry. Sometimes things happen to you that you couldn't possibly make up, but you know years later when you think back and remember an incident that there's something poetic at the heart of it, and you want to write to figure out what it is. So in this piece, this really did happen, what these boys did in the poem. Uh, was too terrible for my imagination to invent. So I wrote a poem called Fear of Snakes. The snake can separate itself from its shadow, move on ribbons of light, taste the air, the morning and the evening, the darkness at the heart of things. I remember when my fear of snakes left for good. It fell behind me like an old skin. In swift current, the boys found a huge snake and chased me down the alleys, Larry Moen carrying it like a green torch, the others yelling, drop it down her back, my terror of it sliding in the runnel of my spine. Larry, the one who touched the inside of my legs on the swing, an older boy we knew we shouldn't get close to with our little dresses, our soft skin, my brother saying, let her go, and I crouched behind the caraganas, watched Larry nail the snake to a telephone pole. It twisted on twin points of light, unable to crawl out of its pain, its mouth opening, the red tongue tasting its own terror. I loved it then, that snake. The boys standing there with their stupid hands dangling from their wrists. The beautiful green mouth opening, a terrible dark bow no one could hear. So these boys really did nail snake to a telephone pole, which is a horrific thing to have done. And years later, I was looking at a dictionary of symbols, and I, I looked up serpent, and it had a subheading, uh, the crucified serpent. And I thought, wow, well, that's what this was, in a way, was a crucified snake. And I looked up the symbolic meaning of it, and the entry was the destruction of the feminine principle. And it just blew me away, because that's really what was going on here, was bullying by these boys. You know, a little bit of sexual abuse, touched the inside of my legs on the swing, and then what they did to the creature at the end, just, just killing it without thought of what it was, its life form, its spirit, its whatever. So often when you're writing poetry, you're writing about things you don't have a clue about. You have no idea of uh, the, the deeper meaning sometimes that the poem is getting at. And Jung would have explained that by talking about racial memory or the collective unconscious, that there are these primal things we sometimes touch into when we do things like write poetry or tell a story, or play a piece of music. This is another older poem. I can't help but read it today because I noticed that pumpkins have started to appear everywhere. Um, in Saskatchewan, we didn't grow fields of pumpkins because we would have had too early a frost and we wouldn't have had time to mature and ripen. So the first time I saw pumpkins was actually when I was a writer in residence at the University of Toronto, and I saw a field of pumpkins in southern Ontario and was stunned by this whole field full of this beauty. I've never seen it before. And I love how we know what time of year it is by what appears in the outdoor markets, uh, you know, from different kinds of flowers to different kinds of vegetables, etc. The poem is called Why I Love Pumpkins. Because they roll into town on the backs of trucks with a loud orange crash, tomatoes, apples, and melons moving from the market stalls to make way for their huge invasion. 
because the grocers pile them row on row with the same skill that builds stone fences. Because this fall, for the first time, living as I now do farther south, I saw a whole field, pumpkins tumbling to the horizon and doubling back, and I had to stop the car and stare, as if I come upon a herd of deer. Because they are more accurate than calendars or clocks. Because of the grin some mother or father carves for a child. Because a candle flickers inside their heads like memory, striking its paper matches and blowing them out. Because they are the last of autumn's light, the last to ripen, an explosion, a contradiction of color in the colorless fields. Because their flowers are deep yellow, because their fine-lobed leaves resemble hearts, because pumpkin seed is also the name of a freshwater fish resembling perch, and the name of a type of sailing boat, because you can therefore travel on a pumpkin seed across any kind of water, or holding it to your ear, hear the secrets of the sea. Because the Oxford English Dictionary says, a single pumpkin could furnish a fortnight's pottage. Because they are not a vegetable for the delicate, the weak-hearted, when you knock on their doors, someone might answer, beckon you inside. Because they are moons defeated by gravity, hugging the earth in their orbits as we do, dust to dust. Because in soups and pies and thick slices of pumpkin bread, we taste what they know of time. Because of the small distances they travel on their trailing vines, because they float just above the earth like lighted buoys marking the safest entrance to the harbor. Because the first snow falls, the first snow falls into the huge silence the pumpkins leave in the fields. Sometimes I uh, envy animals um, because they don't seem to worry like humans do. Some ways their lives seem easier, especially if they live with someone like me. I have two cats, I don't have a dog right now, but if I had a dog, I would be very nice to it. So this is a poem about human envy for other creatures. What comes after? I am my own big dog. Walk, and I'm at the door. Eat, and I take what I offer. Lie down, and I curl on the floor my heavy head between my paws. I don't need anything but this. I don't think of what comes after. I sing the way a dog sings. I weep the way a dog weeps. Every night at my feet, I am a big sack of sleep, stinking of me. One of the uh, earliest series of poems I wrote that became extremely popular, uh, Roy referred to, and that was The Sex Lives of Vegetables. Um, it came from me baking a sweet potato, and when I pulled it out of the oven, the inside of the sweet potato had burst through the peeling, and you know how they're kind of orange, yellowy orange inside. And I thought, oh, it's kind of flashing at me. I thought, you sexy little devil, you sweet potato. <laughs> so I wrote a poem called The Sex Life of the Sweet Potato. And then I thought, well, you know, there's a lot more to say about other vegetables. So I started to think of what else was going on in the garden. And I deliberately didn't write about the sex lives of fruit because it's obvious that fruit is sexy, right? Um, I don't know if you've ever bitten into a ripe fig, 
But now on the coast, we have a big fig tree in our yard. When you bite into that, you know you're engaged in a sexual act of some kind. So fruit was too easy. But I wanted to think, now what would the sex life of a potato be? Uh, what would the sex life of cabbage be? Carrots were so obvious that I delayed writing that poem for quite a while because I thought it was too crazy and silly. Uh, but I showed my, my partner, my fellow poet, Patrick Lane, and he said, no, there's something else going on there besides fun. Just, just keep going with this one. So I'll read you a couple of those, starting with onions. The onion loves the onion. It hugs its many layers, saying, oh, oh, oh. Each vowel smaller than the last. Some say it has no heart. It doesn't need one. It feels whole, primordial, first among vegetables. If Eve had bitten it instead of the apple, how different paradise. <laughs> Cabbages. Long living and slow, content to dream in the sun, heads tucked in, Cabbages ignore the caress of the cabbage butterfly, the soft, sliding belly of the worm. You know it's crazy, but they lie so still, so self-contained, you imagine them laying eggs in the earth's dark pockets. Expect one morning they'll be gone, dragging themselves to the creek behind the house, making their way with great deliberation to the sea. Cucumbers. Hide in a leafy camouflage, popping out when you least expect, like flashers in the park. The truth is, they all have an anal fixation. Watch it when you bend to pick them. <laughs> Potatoes. No one knows what potatoes do. Quiet and secretive, they stick together. So many under one roof, there is talk of incest. Think about it. The pale, dumb faces, the blank expressions, potato dumpling, potato pancake, potato head. In dark cellars, they reach across the potato bins to hold one another in their feet. And I'll conclude with peas, which was raised in the Manitoba legislature uh, as an example of how obscene the sequence was and how it shouldn't be in magazines that went to the Manitoba schools. Um, border crossings is where the sequence first showed up, and they had just gotten a grant from the government, which was buying the magazine for every school in the province, and they lost the grant because they published this sequence. So the poem is called Peas. Peas never liked any of it. They make you suffer for the sweet burst of green in the mouth. Remember the hours of shelling on the front steps, the ping into the basin, your mother bribing you with lemonade to keep you there, popping them open with your thumbs. Your tongue finds some clitoral as it slides up the pond. Peas are not amused. They have spent all their lives keeping their knees together. <laughs> you want to interrupt me at any time and ask a question, just raise your hand. If not, I'll keep going for a while longer. My memoir. Um, it was difficult for me to write a memoir. I got bullied by the publisher into it. It's kind of nice that a publisher wants you to write something in this, these days of Canadian publishing. Um, why I was resistant was because I thought it sounded very self-centered to think that my life would be interesting to anyone else's. I think your life is interesting if you're a rock star or a drug addict or whatever, but being neither of those things, I wasn't sure what growing up in Saskatchewan to a working class family, what, what interest that would have for other, other writers, uh, readers. But then I decided that I would try to capture 
the flavor, the feeling of the landscape, and the feeling of a small town, and try to make that the biggest character in the book. And I was just kind of the side observer of both the town itself and, and the landscape. Where I grew up was in the southwest corner of Saskatchewan, uh, which is grasslands, beautiful, beautiful sea of grass and huge sky, and the light pours in because there's nothing to stop the light. Uh, trees were planted in Sweet Current in parks and as part of, you know, boulevards and houses, but there was only one wild tree that we knew about, and it grew 10 miles north of town. So when a kid said, let's meet at the tree, we all knew exactly where that was. There was only one tree that we went to. Uh, this piece doesn't have anything to do with trees, but I was thinking about a word that was important to me when I was a kid that had a kind of narrative possibility. And that word was spit. Remember how important spit was when you were a kid? Um, and so I looked up the various definitions of spit in the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, which, which takes words back to their original sources and how they change through language. And I used a portion of the dictionary definition to introduce each section. Spit. A small, low tongue of land projecting onto water. A shuttle pin. A straight horizontal stroke used as a marking in books. The fluid secreted by the glands of the mouth. Orange crush. I slid my dime across the counter at Bill Chew's and he pulled a pot wet from the cooler and put it in my hand. It made me greedy. I got maybe one a week and I wanted it all. Even the bottle was beautiful, its long skinny neck, the raised green letters you couldn't scrape away with your thumb, and the bottle was worth two cents. The sun shone through the glass as I tilted the drink to my mouth. It tasted better than oranges, even the ones from Japan that came only at Christmas. There was always a kid who didn't have a dime, who wanted a sip, so I spit in the bottle, watched the bubbles slide down the neck, float on the bright liquid surface before they dissolved, and no one would drink it then. No one but me. Spit. To eject saliva from the mouth by the special effect involved in expelling it. Their whole knowledge was tied only to their tongue and lips and therefore was soon spit out of the mouth again. <coughs> Five grade one girls played in the corner of the school grounds by the fence near the girls entrance just past the wide granite steps. Away from the big kids, all in a row, we grasped the wire mesh with our mittened hands, spit on the snow, then slid our feet back and forth as fast as we could to make a patch of ice. If the teacher would let us in, we dashed through the doors, then dart to the, down the marble floor to the fountain and fill our mouths back out to the fence again, and we'd splat the water at our feet. Every recess with my friends, I rode the ice, frenetic as a gerbil on a wheel, my caged body running nowhere on its own spit, and me too young to know what that might mean. Spit. See how with streams of spit thou art drenched. Come on, she said, do it. I gathered the saliva above my tongue, pushed it to the front of my mouth, pursed my lips, and forced it out. It fell in a long, translucent string, dribbled down the cheek of the girl my friend held on the ground, though the girl squirmed and started to cry. Don't be a baby, my friend said to her. Now you're in the club. You're one of us. Spitter one who spits. My brother hawked on the ground when I walked with him. A shocking thing, that liquid guttural sound and a <clears throat> to the side, right where anyone could step in bare feet or fancy shoes. He was so proud to miss his chin and jacket, to leave his mark on the cement, a circle thin and shiny as a coin, and he wasn't the only one. A chain of spit 
linked the squares of the sidewalk, showing where the men had walked. My father and grandfather did it too. My grandfather's saliva red from snooze. Mom told my brother it was disgusting. He had to stop. What am I supposed to do? He said, swallow it. <laughs> spit. Temperate bathing ripens the spit and helps it up. The kids on the block called him Jewel Face. He was the older boy who lived in the house two doors down who never went to school. We saw him only in the summer when he sat by the back steps on a chrome kitchen chair, his mouth open, a thin stream from the corner of his lower lip running down his chin like it did in the dentist's office until the assistant told you to spit into the bowl. Our mothers warned us to stay away from him, but one day, cutting across his yard, I came too close and he grabbed me, held me on his lap. I wasn't scared, though I knew something wasn't right. He didn't try to rub me between the legs like the old man at the paddling pool who always brought his own towel and asked to dry us. He just held me on his lap, my back against his chest, my head tucked under his chin, my legs dangling. His pants were the thick green cotton grown men wore, and his shirt had metal snap buttons down the front. I could feel them press into my back. I was glad I was turned away because his face was hard to look at, the slack mouth and wet chin, his eyes a soft hurt brown, as if he knew what people said about him. I let myself go limp in his arms and listened to his breathing. It sounded like the panting of a sick cat who had crawled under the bed and wouldn't come out. I wouldn't tell anyone. Wally, I said, you should let me go now, then squirmed out of his hug and ran through his yard to my friends, the top of my head damp with jewel. Spit, the speckled toad defies his foe with a fell spit. My friend's brother, who was in grade 12 when I was in grade 10, took me aside at the Teen Town dance one Friday night. He was still as skinny as a little kid and he wore a dumb looking wool hat, even though it was summer. There was something he had to tell me, but I had to promise not to get mad. It was a trick, he said, he and his friend Jimmy used to play on us. In winter, they slobber on the branch of a tree. If it was cold enough and they got the angle right, their saliva froze before it could hit the ground, forming a row of thin icicles. They'd wait for me and my friend to come up the alley on our way to school. You were always giggling and chattering, he said, we could hear you half a block away. He and Jimmy would act nice. They break the glass sticks from the branch and offer us the best ones, long and glittering in their hands. We'd lick the pointed ends and then put them in our mouths. Now I understood why the boys danced around us as we sucked the ice, why they laughed and punched each other in the arm, laughed so hard they doubled over and hugged themselves, hugged themselves to keep their secret from spilling out. Spit, saliva, spittle, a clot of this. See also cuckoo spit, frog spit. The practical uses of human spit. To hold a kiss curl in place. To shine a shoe. To express disgust. To remove a smear of mascara to lubricate, to seal an envelope, to slicken the lips for a photograph, to defog a scuba diving mask, to test the hotness of an iron, to clear the throat, to turn a doll stone to jade, to determine the direction of the wind, to moisten a wad of gum or a plug of tobacco, to turn a page, to clean a face. Wait, she would say, when I was halfway out the door, let me look at you. 
Always she finds something, lick her finger and rub at a spot on my cheek or chin. I wiggle free of her hands and walk from the house, marked with the snail slide of my mother's fingers, slick tattoos telling my tribe and lineage, my face shining with the signs she drew on me to place me in the world. Remember your mother doing that all the time? And you just thought it was so creepy as a kid. Mothers had to do it anyway. They just wouldn't stop. So if you're writers, sometimes just thinking of one word and the multiple stories you can generate can be a good way into, into writing a longer piece. Finding the stories around spit or, or foot or I don't know, any other thing your mind can go to. Yes? I was just wondering, what compelled you to pursue writing? What can help me to what? Pursue writing. Um, it goes back to when I was in grade one, which I think says a lot for how important it is to encourage kids when they can do something well. And I guess my grade one teacher assigned a poem for us to write. And we had a little toy Pomeranian named, named Tiny. And my dad had uh, really stolen a delivery truck full of oil for an oil furnace and traded that oil for a little dog behind his boss's back. And otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to afford a purebred dog. And, and they're little wee critters. My parents had been farm kids, and they thought you fed draw dog scraps. So they would give the dog bones and things. And we know now we shouldn't do that, especially with small animals, that the bones fragment. And when they work their way through their systems, they actually can tear their digestive systems and their intestines. So we would have chicken every Friday every Sunday night, and every Monday, Tiny would be sick. So I wrote a poem when I, in which I realized my worst fears, and that was that Tiny had died. And it had a refrain, and we shall meet in heaven by and by. A terrible refrain. Who knows where I got that? Sounds a little bit like my Welsh grandmother. Anyway, Miss Fry liked the poem and tacked it on the bulletin board. And then she and everybody else in my class said, oh, this is so terrible, Lorna, that your dog died. How sad for you. And I didn't tell her that Tiny had not died, that the whole poem was a lie. I just kind of nodded and said, yes, it really, it really is terrible. But I think I learned two things about poetry in, in, that, uh, in, in doing that. One was that you lie to get at the truth. And the second thing was that you write about what you feel strongly and, and deeply about. And if you can pull it off, it will mean something to other people. So that kind of got me rolling on poetry, and I, I wrote terrible, you know, suicide poems when I was 14, and unrequited love, and all that kind of stuff. And then it wasn't until my early 20s when I started to really read poetry and take it seriously and, and try to be a good poet, try to be better. Thanks for the question. Um, I'll read a poem that has to do with addiction. In the introduction mentioned that Patrick and I published an anthology called Addicted Notes from the Belly of the Beast. And we wrote, we, we gathered that collection together, that anthology, just shortly before Patrick checked into a treatment center for alcoholism. He was in his early 60s and by that time had been a very, very heavy drinker for over 20 years. And he was really on his way to the grave if he didn't do something about it. You know, he was getting up in the middle of the night to drink a Mickey of vodka. And vodka because he thought I couldn't smell it and you know, all of that kind of terrible, heartbreaking behavior. And we decided that there weren't any books out there about addiction written by really good writers. There were lots of self-help books written by people who were addicts and really couldn't write or written by psychologists or behavior therapists or whatever. So we phoned some of our friends who we knew were addicts in one form or another, and we asked them if they would write an essay on their addiction. Most of them were alcoholics, but there was someone who had a sexual addiction, and there was someone who had a heroin addiction. And this poem is about that latter friend. It's called Needles. His house was full of needles, a few in plain sight, Others hidden between books or under cushions. And one I found on the floor of my car he borrowed, lying there beside a Mars bar wrapper, harmless, I suppose, though it made me cringe. 
I threw it out and said nothing to him, knowing he'd be ashamed, such a gentleman he was, no matter what his state, and loyal to his friends. Now he's gone, I watch his wife in their house with a different kind of needle in her hand. The tip blunt, a dropper draws milk from a cup to feed the runt of the litter. She hadn't noticed how small the kitten was until she caught the mother with it in her mouth, heading out the door. Watching the kitten pull on plastic, I wondered what's the use, but I don't say so. The other four, I know, will be hard enough to give away. Maybe since her husband left, she needs something close to dying she can hold in her hand. Some small thing sucking from a needle that will make it live. Emily Dickinson uh, once said that, that just to live is startling and that there's hardly enough time for anything. And I think the world is a place full of marvels, full of wonders. What I love about writing poetry is not having published another book, but the state you have to get in in order to be receptive to a poem. And that means that you have to be highly attentive. You have to have your ears open and your eyes wide open. You have to be able to sort of touch the air and feel the vibrations of what is there with you and what might be passing through. And I think you need to um, look into uh, the natural world and, and discover what it is that is so stunningly interesting about it. So this poem is called Facts, and that's F-A-C-T-S, not F-A-X. And I think in a way it's an ars poetica for me, a statement about the writing of poetry. It begins with two truths, and then it begins with several truths that I make up that I hope are convincing, because if you believe the first two things, then hopefully you believe the rest. Facts. Do you know an ant has four olfactory organs on each antennae? The female mouse has a clitoris. This I learned from two poets, one famous and American, the other a student of biology and physics. Now, anything is possible. Did you know that grass has legs and feet? That's why it's never still, but runs on the spot like a child in an old gymnasium. Did you know the moon cleans itself with a tongue rough as a cat's? It licks and licks until it disappears, then comes up new again, shiny with spittle. Did you know the yellow butterflies that feed on cabbage have a temper? The winds, a worrying mother. Every dusk she stands in the airy doorway of the world and calls them home. See what I mean? Uh, it's impossible that ants have four olfactory organs on their antenna, right? These other things are impossible too, so then we have to question them. You know, what is, what is metaphor, what is reality, what is imagination, what is fact? Are any of you ever told that you couldn't sing and you were told to be quiet and stand in the back row of the choir and mouth the words? <laughs> Me too. Wasn't that a nasty thing, okay? If, if I could come back in human form, I'm not sure I want to come back, and I'm not sure I want to come back in human but if I could, I would come back with the voice of Emmy Lou Harris or Iris DeMent or, you know, whoever. I want a wonderful singing voice, which I don't have. That's a little bit part of this poem that's called What Comes Next. Here comes my father home from fishing. He never owned a cruel. In a tin bucket, he carries three Lake Pelcher perch for my mother to gut and scale. Here comes my mother with a scraping knife. She didn't know how to fill it then. At supper, the fish fried in butter. She fingers through my portion for the thin white slivers that could catch my breath. No one's ever loved me better. 
Here comes the silence, Sunday's cutlery, and the formal courtesy of passing salt and butter, the only question that gets asked, do you want more tea? My father's hand shaking as it guides the spoon from the sugar bowl to his cup. Here comes the cold unwanted, in the prairie dark, I'm walking home from school where my third grade teacher has put me in the back and told me not to sing. I don't tell anyone. I have no music in me. Here comes the snow, crystals blooming on my scarf where my voice is coming out, my brows and lashes feathered, my lungs marvelous machines that manufacture frost from breath. And cold. Here come the dead. They've had enough of mouthing words below the clouds, enough of ever never asking. Straight from the heart, where there's little left of them, they start singing while we sleep. All the windows in our house gleam white as bone. Lord, I think we need to um, ask for some questions since our time is almost out. Can, can I start by asking you, you know, your, your private life is on the page. And what makes you think that? Well, I, I know you say that poetry is a bit of a lie, or writing is a bit of a lie, but I know in your relationship with Patrick, you, uh, you do express some things there that are really, they're very yeah. private. Yeah. One of my favorite poems that shocked Students, I used it as a sight poem, and they they couldn't write. Was the uh, this one's for you? Ooh, you baby baby comer who can strut like you. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's a, a, a poem from my early feminist days. I, I'm still a feminist, but I found it necessary when I got together with Patrick to be as tough as he was, and so that meant that I had to really assert my strength and my position in our relationship because when I got together with him he was a really really manly guy and he just won the Governor General's Award for Poetry and I wasn't going to be his little poetry bimbo and uh, so that was a tough talking broad in that poem. And Fear of Snakes, the first poem you read to us was made into a film. It won the first prize at the Chicago International Film Festival, Children's Film Festival. $10,000 to the filmmaker who's actually from close to London. He lives in Watford. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I think he gave me 50 bucks for the use of that poem. I mean, I would have given it to him for free. I think it's great when young people are using my work to do whatever. But when he wrote me and said he won $10,000, I said, hey, wait a minute. I've never made that much from a poem. It's a really fine little film. I love what he did. Yes. Yeah, so does it pay to be a writer? No. <laughs> Not a poet, anyway. It pays to be other kinds of writers, a mystery, mystery writer, a Harlequin romance writer. You know, we have some Canadian great literary figures like Margaret Atwood, Michael Andachi, who make a whole bunch of money, but most of us don't. My advance for my latest book of poetry was a thousand dollars. Yes. Um, how was your work, work received at first? Actually, it, it, it was received really well. I was quite lucky. I had some important mentors when I was a young poet. People like Robert Croach and Eli Mandel and Angela Magalski who took me aside and told me I had something. And I think I really needed it because I came from nowhere. You know, uh, My family was not a family of readers. There were no books around the house. There was no art. No one was expected to go on to university. You know, My mom said you should be a secretary. And, and not because she didn't expect much from me, but she didn't think anyone could go to university and they had no money for me to train doing anything. So um, I really needed someone to say, you're doing okay, and thank God they were there for me. I've been really lucky with that. Yeah, you and me. Other than when you're young and your mom telling you to be a secretary, did you find there was another point in your life where you came to a point where you had to decide whether or not this is what you wanted to do? Whether or not to be? Whether or not that that you were discouraged to the point where you didn't know if you wanted to be a writer or a poet anymore? No, you know I wasn't. And I think one of the things that saved me and kept me going in life and saying I do not want to be a secretary was I could not stand my parents' poverty. I, I hated seeing my mother have to beg my father for a dollar to buy groceries. And she cleaned houses to, to make a living, which is 
an okay thing to do now. It wasn't when I was a kid. It was considered to be, you know, a really lowly job. It was called day work, and you were the cleaning woman. And uh, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be independent and always pay my own way. So that drove me to university and writing and all kinds of other things. Yeah. And you had a question. Yeah, uh, I was wondering uh, if you've ever tried your hand at songwriting and if you think that maybe you can convey the same messages. You know what, I have written a few songs and a couple of them have been recorded. Uh, but even more exciting for me is that several composers have taken my poems and turned them into songs. Really? Uh, from classical composers to sort of country and western to popular and, and that's just thrilling. Um, in fact, now there's a woman in uh, Vancouver who used to be the director of Pacific Opera, and she's done so many of my, my poems set to music for a mezzo-soprano and the clarinetist and the pianist that I call her my composer. So I say to people, I'm going to see my composer. <laughs> and it's ironic to me because I don't play music. I, I don't play any musical instruments, so I'm really pleased that they can hear the music in the free verse line. You know, it is consistent metrics, it's music comes from else. So have you ever written a poem specifically to have it written for a song? Or <laughs> I've written a couple of songs. I wrote songs for a play a few years ago, and, uh, and a couple of people put them on their, their records. Yeah. Yes? Do you have any specific advice for poets and writers coming up? Read, 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 read. <laughs> I'm probably being repetitious, I've had all your professors say that. And I've, I've been a teacher of creative writing now for uh, 20 years at the University of Victoria and I honestly don't think my students need me, I think they need books. And I think they have to read carefully all kinds of poetry and read it with the eye of a writer. What is it this writer did? How did they do that? How did they make a poem that moves me? Figure out how they did it. What is it that makes it lift off the page? And that's what you've got to figure out. And don't get discouraged, you know, we're hearing terrible things about the publishing industry now. Maybe you'll all be doing e-books within 10 years and we won't have any, you know, hard paper poetry books. I don't know. But the world's still going to need writers. Someone still has to make up the words, no matter what way. So, yes. How is it you get the ideas for your poetry? Is it just things that you feel strongly about? Yeah, that's it. it. They can come from anywhere. Reading a newspaper article, watching my cat walk across the snow, being angry at my husband, uh, feeling old, anything, absolutely anything can be turned into a poem. I never know what I'm trying to say until I've said it. So when I start a poem, I never know where it's going until I get there. You know, if I knew the end of the poem when I started writing, I wouldn't bother writing it because it would be so boring. This way I go on the journey, the poem takes me on a journey, and then when I get to the end, I go, aha, the end. Oh, so that's what was bugging me, or that's what was obsessing me, or that's the word I wanted to explore. I think we hear the masses up there getting ready to come in because we've taken their, their time. Chemistry class 